All right, so great. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, so my title is The Role of Advancing Image AI and Advancing Image Guidance in Cancer Therapy. I can't go through all of that in 15 minutes, um, so I thought I would just pick kind of one topic and give an overview of how I see AI impacting that area and hopefully uh, tie in um, other areas of image of uh, image-guided cancer therapy. So conflicts of interest, um, very thankful for the support from the NIH, which is funding the clinical trial that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Uh, Bruno Adicio is the interventional radiologist that's the PI on the trial that motivated and is using the work that I'm gonna to talk to you about today, but it couldn't have been done at all with the huge team of people that we have working with us. So there's a lot of advances in image guidance um, to improve cancer care, uh, the delivery of high precision treatments, the assessment of the outcomes, and the motivation of ways to improve that. This includes surgery, focal ablation, as well as radiation therapy. So we're very fortunate at MD Anderson to have a huge number of advanced technology suites, such as the MR Linux, where we've integrated uh, an MR scanner with the radiation oncology device, the brain suite, which puts an MR scanner in the surgical suite, and very sophisticated interventional radiology suites. The problem is our physicians really need more than just imaging in the room. They need the integration of the imaging with the patient and the procedure over the course of time. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. So what I'm going to highlight in this talk today is on liver cancer treatment. So from 2006 to 2015, the incidence of liver cancer increased by 32% and the deaths increased by 25%. Liver cancer is actually the only cancer in the US that's on the rise in incidence as well as death. And patients often have multimodality treatment. So they have one treatment and then they may recur locally or in other areas. And so they may go through surgery, interventional radiology, as well as radiation oncology. And so really giving a very precise and localized treatment is critical to avoid normal tissue injuries such as the liver as well as neighboring structures. And so when we look at focal thermal ablation, which is one of the key players in the treatment of both metastatic disease in the liver as well as primary liver cancer, um, we do this in what we call the interventional suite, which is equipped with a CT scanner, which is great because as you can see in this image here, um, where the yellow is highlighting, we can identify the tumor. So the, we administer IV contrast, we can see the tumor. And then what the physicians want to do is take this ablative needle and place it into the tumor so that it can deliver, deliver a high dose of either microwave or thermal ablation to the tumor. And then we get this image over here. Now the cool thing about interventional radiology um, and focal ablation is that you can see what you delivered. The problem is we can't see the tumor here because we haven't delivered contrast and the needle creates an artifact. And we can see this tiny tumor here, but we can't see the difference between the tumor and the ablation region. Now why does that make a difference? Randomized trials have shown that when you add radiofrequency ablation to liver cancer, it improves the overall survival, as you can show, see here, compared to just delivering chemo alone. But the plot over here shows that if you don't give a sufficient ablation margin around the tumor, that the patients don't do as well. We did a study retrospectively looking at 124 consecutive patients and found these outcomes here. This is cumulative incidence of progression and that if you don't achieve a margin at all, you have a high incidence of progression. But the great thing is we had no local disease progression when we achieved a five millimeter margin. So if we can put the needle in the right place, provide the ablation coverage that we need, we can uh, prevent local recurrence for these patients, which you may be saying, great, look at the image, have them assess that. This study looked and said, if we ask the interventional radiologist to look at the images side by side and determine if a five millimeter ablation margin was achieved, they can't do it. They can't do it if they're new in the field, they can't do it if they've been doing this for 40 years. So we need to provide them advanced image guidance tools so that they can accurately measure it. Now, the kicker here is that we need to do that very fast because the patients are under anesthesia um, and we need to get them in ablated, measure the margin and um, allow them to get into recovery. So this is the summary of the problem in images. We have the tumor that you can see here. We have the needle. We need to make sure that that needle is going into the tumor. We have the ablation zone and we need to map that tumor onto the ablation zone. 
Anyone that has dealt with the liver knows that it likes to deform, it moves with breathing, it moves um, just because it's a squishy tissue, and so we can't do rigid registration for that. The other problem is anyone that's worked in image registration knows that when the majority of deformable image registration algorithms rely on intensity. They take bright spots in this image, bright spots in this image, make them align, and everyone is good to go. The problem in this scenario is that in your contrast image, you can see all of the vasculature. In the, in the needle image, there's no vasculature, and now you have this big needle artifact. And in the ablation region, you have this dark spot, and you have this dark spot, but we don't want to align the boundaries of that dark spot. So that causes another problem. So what we have found over the last couple of decades is that using biomechanical deformable registration can solve problems like this. So I'm not going to go into all of the details today except to tell you that we've developed this technique. It relies on contouring the liver. So we have to segment all of the boundaries of the liver on every slice of the CT scan. We take the, the contours, we convert it into mesh, we take the mesh, we assign biomechanical properties, uh, boundary conditions, and then we solve this in a finite element analysis. When we just do it on the liver, it takes about two to four minutes. So not real time, not really close to real time, but something that we can actually do in the interventional suite. This has voxel level of accuracy that we've determined in lots of studies, so we know we're doing this with a fairly high precision. Now, Given this high correlation between ablation margin and the recurrence and the need for these advanced tools, how do we make this workflow more automated? Hopefully you see what's coming, AI segmentation of the liver. Uh, so we set out to do this actually several years ago. This article was um, finally published in 2021 because everyone said AI segmentation of the liver is solved, but we couldn't find any software tool that actually worked clinically in our system because we wanted to use this for our trial. So Brian Anderson, who was a previous grad student, looked at several different algorithms, found that the Deep Lab V3 Plus with the exception backbone worked the best. So we used data from MD Anderson, we used contrast enhanced data as well as non-contrast enhanced data, and we took data from one of the Mikai challenges, which was a great way to augment our data and to get some diversity in that. So we wanted a variety of images coming in, both with contrast and non-contrast, so that we had a very robust algorithm. The results are shown here in terms of the dissimilarity coefficient and the mean distance to agreement. So these results are fantastic. Uh, dissimilarity coefficient goes up to one. This is well, well, well higher than the inter-observer variability that we would see and the mean surface distance is on the order of the voxel. But the reality is, doing that, anyone who's, who's created these algorithms and quantified them quantitatively knows that when you go and show them to a clinician, a lot of times it doesn't actually translate. So we took another 50 liver cancer patients, 25 with hepatocellular carcinoma and 25 with colorectal liver mets that were treated in radiation oncology where they already had the contours of the liver done. So these are contours that were done by the clinical team, approved by a dosimetrist, a physicist, as well as a radiation oncologist. And then we segmented it using our AI algorithm. This is a blinded comparison between our deep learning segmentation in blue and the clinical contours in orange. And you can see that in over half of the cases, the radiation oncologist, we had a team of three of them, blinded to which one was which, picked the AI segmentation over the clinically approved and used contours. Now, we also looked at clinical usability. This was um, a, an average over all of the radiation oncologists, and we found that 80% of them were deemed as clinically usable. So there was a few that weren't. So the question, of course, arises is how do we determine which ones are not clinically usable, which ones are out of distribution, if you will. And these are the cases that failed. So this one failed where it had a stent here, and you can see that the liver segmentation in red missed that part of the actual liver that is shown in blue. And this is a patient that had ascites. Now the really interesting thing here for anyone that's developing and validating algorithms is if you look at this dice coefficient, it's 0.94. That's an exceptional dice fit coefficient. Um, you would never look at that and say that you would expect some kind of problem, but you do because the liver can be fairly large and this was a very localized error on one slice. So that's an indication of just how important it is, we believe, to do qualitative assessment as well as quantitative assessment. 
the, both of these cases indicate data that was out of the distribution. So when we went back and looked at our training cases, there were no cases with ascites and there are no other cases with stents. So one of the questions that we had is as we roll this out into large groups, as we roll this out into our clinical practice, into our trial, how do we find a way to detect that? And so that's what Mikhail Woodland, who is a grad student at Rice, um, working in our lab is looking at. So she's trying to do an out of distribution detection using a GANS detection. So the idea is that you put an image in, you do automated segmentation, and you put it into a detector. And this detector has a generator which takes the image in, runs it through the generator to get a reconstructed image, and looks at how similar those are. Now, if the image is out of distribution, this reconstruction should not be good, and that score would be very high, and therefore detect that it's out of distribution. So there's lots of goals and applications for this. How can we mine our huge database at MD Anderson to find data that we need to pull in? How do we predict cases that are going to fail clinically so that we can try to do something proactively? And how, when we roll this out at a large scale, do we identify cases that need to be manually um, evaluated with higher level of scrutiny than the other cases? Now, the next step was to segment the tumor. Now, liver tumors come in all different shapes and sizes and contrast enhancement, as well as variability in the um, quality of the CT, as you can see here. Um, so we also wanted to develop a technique that we could share with the community. And so in order to do that, we got two publicly available data sets, the LITS data set and the 3D IR CAD. You can see the training and validation and testing distribution here. And uh, Brian Anderson, when he was finishing up his PhD, came up with this very sophisticated uh, technique that used a hybrid W net, as you can see here with this 2D pre-trained feature extractor and the 3D dense net, um, combining that all together to come up with something that would be very robust. And so these are the results. So we looked at the data for tumors that were less than 15 millimeters and greater than 15 millimeters. And the reason for that is the majority of cases for patients that are treated with focal liver ablation have a size of about 15 millimeters or greater. So you can see that our sensitivity for the large tumors that we're seeing for this application was very high at 98%, but for the much smaller tumors, the dice similarity coefficient was really bad and our sensitivity was really bad. However, we had a false positive rate as a median of one. So this was really important for our application, which we needed very timely. We needed it for around 15 millimeter or greater tumors, and we needed it to not create all these false positives that then we had to deal with. You can see the mean dice similarity coefficients um, here for all of these cases, including MD Anderson colorectal mets at 15, as well as the ablation region. So the plus side of the ablation region looking like the tumor is that we can create one segmentation algorithm and use it for both. We went back to our qualitative evaluation as well and looked at 24 colorectal liver metastases. We, looked, we asked three radiologists to evaluate the score of those contours, and you can see that here. So for the colorectal liver metastases, all of the segmentations for all of the observers was rated as a four or a five, being good or excellent. And the average score for the, the liver ablation area was 4.1, and that was on 19 um, images that were not seen by the training algorithm. Um, and there was a couple of those that failed um, and had a poor or very poor, or sorry, just a poor or a fair assessment. Now, I'd like to go back and talk about the sensitivity and really talk about how you need to, we need to tailor these algorithms to match our application. So we went back and said, okay, what if we wanted to detect all of the tumors and not just the larger tumors? So we changed the prediction cutoff to 0 0.01 from that 0 0.55, and now our sensitivity went up much higher, but of course at the expense of that false positive, um, which now went up to an astounding 139. So I think it's important as we develop these techniques to be able to tailorize and optimize them to the application that we have um, so that we can mitigate that sensitivity specificity, false positive rate, and optimize those algorithms. Now, these tools we are using um, today in our randomized phase two clinical trial because we can see the outcome of that. If the liver segmentation fails, we can see that, we can correct it on the fly. If the tumor segmentation fails, we can see that also and correct it on the fly. What I'm gonna talk about next is some kind of future work that we're investigating that has 
more uncertain um, uncertainty impacts in the clinic. And so the first is, as I mentioned, the AI segmentation takes about two to four minutes. So if we want to increase that speed, can we use AI to do that? And so one of the things that we're looking at now, and this is very preliminary work, is how can we train an AI prediction to predict the biomechanical deformable registration? So we don't want to feed in those two intensity distributions. We want to feed in the outcome of the AI and to be able to predict that. And so even with a very small number of cases, we're doing a fairly good job. 75% of the points in the liver are within the voxel dimension. The problem with this is there's no way when we have that needle image to be able to visualize the confirmation. It's not like the segmentation of the liver and tumor where we can correct that. If it fails, we may not necessarily know. And the last piece is can we forget all of that altogether and just use AI to predict the outcome that the patient will have? And so we started to do that as well. And you can see that here using this DenseNet 121 to be able to feed in the pretreatment image and the post-treatment ablation image and have it predict whether that patient will experience a recurrence or not. Again, these become more complicated. How do you look at that heat map? How do you interpret whether it's an out of distribution data set or whether something went wrong compared to actually physically measuring it and getting that data set? But the AUC, by combining these data sets and including the deformable registration to align that, gave us a result of 0.81, so a pretty reasonable result, again, with a fairly small number of data sets in the order of just over 100. So in conclusion, advances in image guidance can improve the precision and accuracy of focal therapy, as well as assessment of the outcomes. We believe that things like biomechanical modeling can improve the accuracy, especially in areas of challenging sites. And that's where we can really rely on and utilize AI um, in terms of segmentation and optimization to be able to speed those things up. The translation of AI requires very careful consideration, especially in areas where we can't actually do that validation. Um, and I think there's a significant opportunity space, um, of course, for AI to be able to predict outcomes and then use these kinds of predictions for decision-making, resource stratification, and clinical trial design. Thank you so much for your attention. Maybe just one question for Christy. Any questions for Christy? I know we're all ready for coffee and uh, hot chocolate, so um, yes, Madhuri. So what would be a scenario for deploying this capability in the clinic, right? Because let's say you have a patient and the AI comes up with a, say, 85% accurate delineation, but then there's the last little piece. Do you, do you have any thoughts on how you can accept maybe the radiologists yeah, sorry, so we're doing inputs. this, we're using this as a clinical trial now. So right now, the the, radiolo the interventional radiologist gets the image with the tumor, we do the segmentation of the liver and the tumor, he puts the needle in, and we get an image with that, which I showed, but now we map the tumor on, so they can see if the needle's now in the tumor, or as it happens occasionally, it misses the tumor because the liver is deformable. They can then reposition the needle, and then they do the ablation, and then once the ablation is complete, then they map the tumor onto the ablation and see whether they have the five millimeter coverage. If they don't have the five millimeter coverage, then they go back and do a further ablation. But then are you retraining your networks based on that? Do you have a process for that? So that, that were the AI outcomes prediction we're not using in the trial. We're using the actual biomechanics in the trial. Um, and so we need to add more patients into the uh, outcomes prediction for sure to give more variability. Thank you, thank you, great work. Let's all thank Christy again. We have a short break, uh, about 20 minutes. We'll be back here at 2.30.